let's pray and we'll get into the word for today. Lord, thank you uh, for the weeks that we've spent looking at the life uh, of Noah and his family, the um, the way that you the way that you called him, the way that he lived, the way that he obeyed, and then here as we look at sort of this last chapter of his life, uh, I pray that your Spirit will teach us um, how to view and deal with the sin in our own life as we learn lessons from the end of the life of Noah and from his family. I pray that you would take the time today, that you would use it to teach us and to convict us and to help us to follow you more closely as we live by your Spirit, walking with your Son. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. It's... um. It is always sad to me, and maybe even a little bit shocking, um, when a Christian leader who appears to, who seems to have a good reputation, um, falls into sin. I, I'm not going to dive into, but over the last week, there have been incredible revelations about um, a a man who seemed to be a great Christian apologist, preacher, thinker, writer, leader, evangelist, um, who it appears has for many years been living a double life. And I don't want to get into the details of that, but um, it is striking to me that all of this has come so boldly to light in a week that I've been preparing to to speak kind of on this on this very subject uh, referring to the life of Noah um, I know that we all sin but when I talk about a Christian leader who falls into sin I'm talking about uh, when this when this man or woman falls into a public sin the kind of sin that brings shame to the name of Christ and that brings shame to the church and may very well disqualify the person from from ministry from public ministry now it it used to be that when I would hear of this kind of fall uh, my initial response would be something along the lines of I cannot believe this what happened how could this person let this happen Unfortunately, um, this has become such a common occurrence that I think I've become a little jaded to it. Uh, it's almost like I've come to expect some sort of public fall or at least some sort of public embarrassment from well-known Christian leaders. And I don't like that. I don't like that, that I feel that way. I don't like that these individuals allow themselves to come into this condition or this situation and these are just the well-known and high profile that we hear about in the news generally it's not the the little guys who are pastoring or leading or serving in other contexts that I suspect are having a lot of the same problems at probably pretty similar rates. And um, it scares me, to be honest. Like, I don't want to be like that. I want to be more like the old English evangelist and missionary. He, he was most well known for founding and operating orphanages. His name was um, George Muller. And over the course of his life, he, although he did all these other things, he was most well known for operating these orphanages in England, around Bristol, England. Over the course of his life, he cared for over 10,000 children. And after many years of walking with the Lord, um, it, it, it has been said that, that Mueller used to pray, uh, Lord, Lord, don't let me become a wicked old man. 
The truth is that, that none of us, no matter how long we profess to have been a Christian, no, longer, no matter how long we have uh, tried to walk with God, none of us are immune from a constant struggle with sin. For some of us, it's particular actions. For others of us, it's attitudes or it's our thought life or it's the way we treat others or it's whatever it is. But none of us are immune from the struggle against sin. And, and I think that in all of Scripture, um, Noah stands out as an incredible example of this. Now remember, Noah had been called by God, he had been recognized by God for his righteousness, for his faith, for his desire to, to walk with God, to follow God. And um, he had walked with God for over 600 years. He was head of the family that God had chosen to save from the judgment of the flood, to repopulate the earth. He was, he was the guy. And when, when, the, when the flood had ended, he had built the ark, he had gotten on the ark with all of those animals. <clears throat> he had been on the ark for over a year, and when he and his family got off the ark, like the first thing he did was build an altar and make sacrifices to God. He worshipped God. And then what happened? He grew a vineyard, he made wine, he got drunk. He was naked in his tent. We don't know exactly what all that means, but let's, let's read our text for today. And we're going to finish out Genesis 9 and this series on the flood. Genesis 9, beginning in verse 18, says this. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the sons, these were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his, uh, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders when they walked uh, in, in backward and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father naked. When Noah woke from his wine and found out what his younger son, a youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves. He will be to his brothers. He also said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Noah lived a total of 950 years, and then he died. Now, I want to start with this, just a simple uh, recognition that throughout Scripture, without exception almost, and, and without exception completely for drunkenness and almost for nakedness, these are always referred to, they are always presented as shameful or presented in a negative light. Now, because of this, I think it's absolutely fair to conclude that Noah sinned. And I don't think, like this was a fall for Noah. And Noah's sin shows us that even the godliest among us are prone to sin. None of us are immune from this struggle with temptation and sin. When it comes to godliness, Noah was top shelf. He was top of the line. He was the most righteous man on earth before the flood. And centuries later in the book of Ezekiel, God listed Noah, Daniel, and Job as three of the most righteous people on the planet. And yet Noah got drunk and lay naked in his tent. And as Larry read to us earlier from 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul writes, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Past godliness. 
while good and important, past godliness does not guarantee future godliness. I don't know if they still do this on commercials for financial services on television, but all of those uh, advertisements for mutual funds and all these finance, retirement funds and stuff, and they tout their performance at beating the stock market and do, having great returns. At the end, the voice would say something to the effect of uh, uh, past results do not guarantee future returns or something that, they, yeah, something of that nature. And I, it's exactly true when it comes to our, to our spiritual life and our, our righteousness, our obedience, our walking with God. Our, the past doesn't guarantee the future. We don't build up, this isn't like, the, like an illness where you build up an immunity towards sin. Doesn't matter how old we get, how mature we get spiritually, that does not protect us against temptation. That's why we have to walk in dependence on the Holy Spirit. That's why we rely on the Spirit to lead us, to strengthen us, to guide us, to, to inform our conscience. Noah's sin teaches us a lot of things, and we're going to go over several of those today, but but, but one of the things I think it teaches us is that we are so often our, at our most uh, vulnerable when things get easy. After the battle, Noah had, uh, had grown up and lived in this world that was incredibly wicked. God called him and he built this ark and he went through his the storm and he went through the flood and he spent a year in that boat and he gets off of the boat and it's just him and his family and they're starting over. And, and I know, he, he got off and he relaxed. Whew, it's over. I can, I can breathe again. I can relax. The battle, we've come through this battle. And when he did that, he fell into sin. When the pressure's off, our guard comes down, and, and, and those who, who live righteously before God, part of that is knowing their own tendency to sin, their own dependence on the Holy Spirit, their own, the things that are tempting to them, and being aware of those things so that they don't succumb and fall prey to those temptations. Ham, his youngest son, Ham saw the nakedness of his father. He went and told his brothers. And they carefully went and covered uh, Noah up. They covered their father up. And so when Noah woke up, he knew what Ham had done. We don't know exactly uh, how that all transpired. But, but he knew and he, he, he proclaims this curse not against Ham, but against Ham's son, Canaan. Now, there's a lot of questions, and we're not going to dig too deeply into, into a lot of this because we just can't. For one thing, we're not going to take the time. And the other thing is, there's so much that we just cannot know or completely understand. But some of those questions are things like, what did Ham do? Like, he didn't just... Surely he didn't just see Noah, and that was enough for all this. And was it really that serious? And why wasn't Ham punished? And why, why is Canaan cursed for his father's sin? And, and, and since Noah's the one who started this, and Noah's the one who got drunk and, and passed out in his tent, why wasn't Noah punished? Why was he allowed to proclaim this curse on his grandson? Now, there's commentators and scholars and theologians for centuries have struggled for answers and the truth is we won't ever really know all the answers to these questions but I do want to address the first one briefly and and that is what did Ham do we don't know exactly but I would say that the most likely answer is that when he looked on his father, he probably did so with some kind of uh, lust or amusement or something. Like it, he found some kind of pleasure in this. And we don't know if it was like a, like a physical pleasure or if it was um, a, an opportunity to mock his father uh, or, or whatever it was. But 
he went out, he told his brothers, and he didn't tell them in a spirit of concern or grief or anguish, oh my, look what our father has done. It, it was like he went out and mocked them, I would guess. And hey, guys, you want to see the, the craziest thing, the funniest thing. I can't believe this. you got to check out. And so he treated this so lightly. And I think this tells us some things about Ham. I mean, one, he, he didn't have any kind of shame when it came to moral failure. Like he, in a sense, he celebrated when moral failure occurred. And the second thing it tells us is that he didn't really respect his father. He, he completely abused the honor of his father. And we can see this um, contrasted the way his brothers reacted to the exact same situation. Rather than mocking, rather than uh, uh, whatever it is that Ham did, they very seriously, and the Bible describes in, in real detail how they carefully walked backwards so as not uh, to, to see him. They covered him. They treated him with respect even in the midst of his fallenness and his brokenness. We live in a culture that is so morally um, broken, so morally loose. It's easy for us to see Shem and Japheth's actions and be confused by them and not be shocked by the way Ham treated his fathers. I mean, it would be easy for us to, to see Ham and say, eh, what's the big deal? This shows us this kind of response shows us what we need to learn. And, and I think the first thing is that is that we become so easily, become so calloused by sin. What's the big deal? Ham looked on his father's nakedness, the text tells us. And when Noah found out, he proclaims this curse over uh, Ham's son and, and their descendants. And on the surface, that seems extreme, it seems harsh maybe unfair um, but when we take that attitude I think what that does is it tells us more about us than it does about that situation I think it shows uh, how calloused over we come when it comes to sin to moral failure we're so used to having I'll just say it so used to having moral filth um, just sort of dumped in on us uh, uh, through television and movies and the internet that we don't even really recognize it when we see it anymore. And, and even worse, we often find those things humorous. And I'm as guilty as anybody I know when it comes to this. It, it reminded me many years ago, um, I worked uh, for a guy uh, one, one summer painting houses. Uh, it was you know, hard, messy, hot work here in Texas, and it, you know, I pretty much hated it. But um, I was reminded that, you know, when I, I would get on a job and I would open up a bucket of paint and stir that thing up, the smell of paint. You all know what wet paint smells like. Well, it was just, it was overpowering almost. I mean, you get in a room or in a house, uh, in a room with a big bucket of paint, and you open it up, stir it up, and you're in this closed space, and it's just, uh, but it doesn't take, it didn't take very long, just a few hours, you just really couldn't smell it anymore. Like you became so accustomed to it. And, and I think we get that way about sin. Not just the sins we commit, although that's certainly true, but even the ones we expose ourselves to knowingly. After a while, we just don't really notice it. And the only way to become more sensitive to sin it's to spend time in the Word. And when I say time in the Word, I mean that two ways. I mean in the written Word, in the Scripture, but also, as John 1 tells us, in, 
in the living word, in Jesus. Like we need to be in our relationship with Jesus and we need to grow that by being in the written word, in the scripture. And, and, and to expose or to avoid exposing ourselves unnecessarily to the evil around us. We live in a world that is, that is evil and we're going to be exposed to that. But that doesn't mean we have to seek it out. There's enough of it that just comes our way. Anyway, Ham's sin uh, shows us um, that sins which don't seem like a big deal at the time so often can have huge consequences in the future. And not just for ourselves, but for our kids and our grandkids and even generations to come. Noah's drunkenness and his impropriety led to Ham's irreverence. Ham's sin eventually led to the corruption of the Canaanites. Remember, this was Ham's son Canaan that was cursed. And, and the Canaanites would, would go on to become this nation, this people who, were, who practiced incredibly violent sin and sexual sin. You see how this thing grew over time. It started with Noah passing out drunk, improper, Ham treating him poorly, not respecting him, maybe, maybe having lustful thoughts, and then on to Canaan, who, who grew into a whole people who were incredibly evil. But what about the problem of Canaan being cursed for Ham's sins? I think there are some things we can say about that. Now, the first thing is, like it or not, the sins of parents absolutely affect children and grandchildren. There's no getting around that. Uh, and sometimes for generation after generation after generation. And we see this go on in the world around us. Um, even if you take God out of the picture, and you don't try to make a spiritual lesson out of it, you, you still see it. Uh, it it is a reality, unfair though it seems to be, that some children are loved and others are abused. And when, when children are cared for, they, uh, the family tends to progress a certain direction. When they are neglected, the family tends to progress a different direction. Kids often suffer because of their parents' self-centered lives, their parents' sinful lives. It's only when we put God into the picture that there's any hope because through the gospel, these children have a chance to break out of this uh, cycle of abuse and have a chance to raise their children properly. We also see that Noah's words uh, are not really a curse. They're more like a prophecy. In other words, Noah, Noah is talking about what's going to happen in the future. It's like a, like a prophetic oracle. But it's not him... It's not him proclaiming and, and saying that I'm causing it to be this way. He's not putting, you know, a, what we would think about like putting a hex on his grandson so that Canaan couldn't help himself and all those descendants were, their fate was doomed and, and fixed like that. It, it was, he was predicting that all of Canaan's descendants would serve the descendants of Shem and Japheth. And by the way, we could do you know, historical studies of which people groups come from which of Noah's sons, and you'll see that this happened. Uh, also, to understand this curse on Canaan, we need to remember not, that the Canaanites were not innocent people. They weren't unjustly suffering under a curse that was imposed on them by this ancestor. They were a people that were corrupt morally. Their sin exceeded that of their ancestor. Like I said, the, the sin progressed over time, got worse and worse over time as generation after generation came along. When God, much later uh, in Genesis, uh, God orders Moses as they uh, are going to go into the promised land, he orders Moses to kill all the people dwelling in the land of Canaan. Which, by the way, Israel never fully carried out. It was God's judgment on their unrepentant sin. 
They weren't innocent victims. And, and then it helps us understand this passage if we fit it into, into the reason Moses wrote the book of Genesis. So, so as the scriptures, as the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of scripture to write, there's a purpose for all of these. And that's why everything is not just alike. These are books of history and law, but they have a theological point. Moses is writing the book of Genesis and, and the rest of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. He's writing this to a, to a stubborn nation of people, a disobedient nation of people who had developed a habit of returning um, into sin and into spiritual bondage. And we see that played out as the Israelites are, are fleeing Egypt and making their way toward the promised land. They, they seem to have a desire to return to physical bondage in Egypt. And Moses, at the end, he's about to die. He's writing all these, this record down because he's not going to be the one leading him into the land. And he, he wrote this to show them, to show Israel, and frankly to show us God's pattern of, of, of blessing those who obey him and follow him and live righteously and of cursing those who disobey. You know, to show that there are consequences for our actions and that the way we live is important. He wanted... Uh, the people of Israel to be motivated to go through whatever hardship they had to go through and take the land and keep themselves from the contamination of the Canaanite people who lived there. I, I want to I make some points of application from this passage. This is it, it's a hard passage in terms of it's awkward, it doesn't often make sense to us, it doesn't seem right or fair or just, but I think there are some great lessons, some very important lessons that we can learn through this. And one of those is that we need to be careful not to allow someone else, especially our own family, not to allow someone else's sin to trigger sin in us. Noah's sin led to Ham's sin which led to Canaan's sin, which led to, led, to, led to generation after generation after generation, a corrupt nation. Sin is a lot like a chain reaction. One person's sin leads to the next, to the next, to the next, until there is a trail of pain and heartache and devastation that is undeniable. This is true in your life and mine. Maybe you had a parent who, who was an alcoholic. Maybe you had a parent who was abusive. It's really easy for us to react to their sin by sinning. There's an old expression in, in um, trying to help people who are hurting and broken, and that is that hurt people hurt people. People who have been damaged, people who have been hurt, people who have been mistreated, tend to follow that pattern out in their own lives with those around them. Children of abusive parents are more likely to be abusive. Children of alcoholic parents are more likely to become alcoholics. Children of, like you can, it's a pattern that just goes on and on and on. It's true in our marriages. If you have a, a spouse who is self-centered, who treats you poorly, it's easy to respond to that by being self-centered, by, by, by putting a shell around, by becoming, uh, by becoming selfish rather than responding with the love of Jesus. Uh, another lesson, it, it's important to honor our parents even if they failed. It's also important regardless of how old we are. Ham was a father of at least four. Canaan was was his fourth son. And while this story predates the Ten Commandments and, and, and should we apply the Mosaic Law of honor your father and mother, I, I don't know the answer to that. 
But I do know that that commandment was repeated in the New Testament in Ephesians by the Apostle Paul. And he reminded uh, the people that this commandment is the first commandment with a promise so that you may live, uh, so that it may go well with you and you'll enjoy long life on the earth. This is not just about kids living at home. It's about all of us. Respect for parents, even for sinful parents, which, by the way, uh, all of us are. It, it's at the core of a healthy family, a healthy society, but it's also at the core uh, of being spiritually healthy yourself. And it may be that your parents have passed on and you're still struggling with anger and bitterness and resentment about things they did or the way they treated you or whatever it is in their brokenness and their sinfulness, their fallenness. And I think it's still possible for you to forgive them, for you to let go of that weight and that burden, for you to still honor them, even in all their failures and brokenness. We bring God's judgment on ourselves and our children and our grandchildren when we disrespect our parents. And then I, I don't think it would be fair to, to address this passage without drawing this lesson out of it, that we need to beware the dangers of alcohol. This uh, is the first mention of wine in all the scripture. And it's not a pretty picture. Noah, who by all accounts had lived an incredibly godly life, who was considered righteous, um, was trapped by this wine. And, and when he got drunk, it didn't end in a good time. It ended in shame and a curse and slavery. And, and that's often still the case. People still find that happening in their lives as they succumb to the temptation of alcohol. Now, I, I'm going to I'm just going to say, like we as a church, we hold a officially hold a position uh, of, of not drinking at all. But I, I will also acknowledge that the Bible does not out and out prohibit a careful use of wine, but the Bible does over and over and over warn us about the dangers of drinking. And the Bible clearly condemns drunkenness. And in Galatians 5, when that's so well known for the fruit of the Spirit, if you read the larger context, it, it contrasts the fruit of the Spirit with the works of the flesh. And drunkenness is considered one of those works of the flesh. In other words, drunkenness is the opposite of living in the Spirit. And drunkenness or alcoholism is such a widespread problem today. And, and, and I read some statistics, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that, that since this COVID-19 pandemic has begun, alcohol sales have skyrocketed. As people have used that as a way to cope with, with isolation and loneliness, fear, this is such a problem in our country and in our society. My encouragement to you would be not to drink at all. Because while it may not be sin to take that one drink, I know for a fact that you will not become an alcoholic, you will not get drunk if you don't take that one drink. Anyway, Noah's sin... His life shows us that even the most godly among us are prone to sin. We are all susceptible. Ham's sin and the curse that was placed on Canaan, it shows us how callous to sin we've all become. But there's one other thing I want to point out, and it's a lesson that we can learn from those other two brothers, from Shem and Japheth. And that is this. We don't have to fall to temptation. Like you can, you can rise above. You can do the right thing. You can be tempted and not sin. 
And when we do that, we receive God's blessing for that, but, but that's a pattern, like all of these things. Just like sin is a pattern that can be passed down in a family, righteousness is a pattern that can be passed down in a family. Shem and Japheth uh, took this action of carefully covering their father. They showed respect for him and they showed fear of God. And because of this, Noah not only pronounced a curse on Canaan, on Ham's son, he pronounced a blessing on these other two brothers. The blessing shows us that, that God, that the Lord, and, and he, he uses the personal name for God, the, the covenant name for God, that he would be the, the personal covenant God of Shem and of his descendants. This was fulfilled in Abraham and in the Jewish nation. And it was fulfilled in the fact that, uh, that Jesus himself, that the, the promised one, the Messiah, the Christ, would come from this line of Shem. Canaan would go on to serve Shem. And, and, and we see this in that, that as the Jews moved into, as the Israelites moved into the promised land, they displaced the Canaanites. They, the Canaanites became subservient to the, to the people of Israel. And Japheth, the other brother, was blessed when, God, or when, when his dad, when Noah said, May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. This came to fulfillment later um, when Japheth's descendants would grow and expand and, and spread to the north and to the west. They, they eventually spread throughout Europe and even to America. They, that, that is the line that eventually would come from Japheth. And this is the first glimmer, by the way, uh, of this, this about the line of Japheth living in the tents of Shem. This is a, this is a prophecy. This is a, a foreshadowing, a glimpse of the scriptures that would talk about the grafting in of the Gentiles into the spiritual blessings of Israel. We who are Japheth's descendants have been blessed by dwelling in the tents of Shem. We have been brought in as one of God's people. And the, the application, the, the, the thing for us to see in Shem and Japheth's actions is that we don't have to yield to temptation. When Ham came and told them what was going on, what he saw, what he experienced, they could have joined in with him. They could have mocked Noah. They could have done whatever it is that Ham had done, but they didn't. They showed respect for their father. They showed fear of God, and they didn't sin. Ham couldn't blame his sin on his father because his brothers showed that there was another option. And while these are patterns that tend to happen that parents pass on to their children and grandchildren, they are patterns that tend to happen. They are not absolutes. We are all responsible for our own actions, and we can, through the power of the Spirit, break these cycles in our families' lives. If you want a blessing on your life, if you want your children and grandchildren and future generations to be blessed, don't yield so easily to the sin that Hebrews says so easily besets us, so easily enslaves us. Paul writes in Romans 6 about being slaves to righteousness. Listen, here's the bottom line. Uh, though we are prone to sin, though we have a tendency to sin, we can obey God and we can experience His blessing. A ask yourself a question. Do I want God's blessing in my life? Do I want God's blessing for my children? Do I want God's blessing for my grandchildren? I don't know anybody who would honestly say anything other than an emphatic yes. Yes, I want God to bless my life and my children and my grandchildren. Well, 
the way to experience that is through obedience to Him. And maybe, maybe your response to that is, well, that's the problem. I'm weak. I have trouble obeying. The first step toward obedience is to recognize that you are not strong, that you are weak, that you can't obey on your own, that you tend toward sin, that I tend toward sin. Recognizing that, being self-aware of that, it, it, it pushes us to be dependent on the Holy Spirit who, who lives and works in us as followers of Jesus. That, that He frees us from the captivity of sin. That if we know Christ, we can obey Him. Jesus came to free us from sin. If you know Him, you can stop sinning. And my guess is that some of us really need to do that. Maybe, maybe there's a particular sin or kind of sin that you're particularly pr prone to. You've dabbled in or messed with. Or, and you need to deal with that. Senator, uh, the former Senator Phil Graham from here in Texas used to say, talking about balancing the federal budget, he used to say balancing the budget is like going to heaven. Everybody wants to do it. They just don't want to do what you have to do to make the trip. Now, his view of getting to heaven uh, may not have been quite spot on, but obedience sure is a lot like that. We're all for it. Like Nobody wants to be disobedient. Nobody wants, no believer, no Christian, no genuine follower of Jesus wants to live in rebellion and in disobedience. We want to be obedient. We just don't want to do what we have to do to be obedient. We want God's blessing for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. We've got to be serious about being obedient to God and about being tough and honest about the sin that is in our lives. Let's pray. We'll close the message, Lord. As we've talked about sin and we've talked about family, I pray that you would help us to be good parents, and grandparents, and leaders in our community and mentors and, and that, we would, that we would work to be obedient, that we would work to put you first so that future generations and our families will see that and follow you because of our example. Lord, if there's a particular sin in my life, reveal that to me. If there's a particular sin in people's lives, show that to them. Help them to confess and repent and through the power of the Spirit to live in obedience and in holiness. To live well and to finish well. We ask it in Jesus' name.